Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode 151. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Tuesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, the final countdown is beginning exactly one week from today. The Pittsburgh Steelers will be reporting to training camp and back to Latrobe, PA, and St. Vincent College for the first time since 2019. So getting ready for camp. How about you, Dave? Yeah, look, you you got got to load up, polish up that Porsche, and uh, <laughs> keep this, saying that it's not any truth. <laughs> this time, I guess about this time next week, you'll you'll be you'll be on the road to uh, to, to St. Vincent College, right? So, uh, uh, a, a, a very exciting time. I, I reckon we'll probably record the uh, uh, the Tuesday podcast for of next. I don't know if we're going to go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or we'll we'll have to figure all that out, but. Uh, uh, definitely an exciting time, but the real question everybody has right now is what is your Madden 23 rating, Alex? <laughs> uh, I have not made the cut. They've ignored me yet again. Um, I assume your speed rating is not as good as Calvin Austin's. No, 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 it's not. I, I think my Madden, Madden rating would be like a two, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's got everybody a buzz right now. And I think the edge rushers are being released uh, today. Uh, they've already released that uh, Miles Garrett is a club 99 uh, member. They're slow rolling this out just to drive people like me and you absolutely nuts. Uh, I imagine about halfway through this podcast uh, is when the rest of the uh, edge rushers will be announced and all. And uh, you have you you have more recency when it comes to playing Madden than I do by about I don't know twenty years. <laughs> uh, are you excited about Madden twenty three? What's the last Madden that you bought? Uh, what do you think about some of these wide receiver and tight end uh, ratings out there? Well, first, speaking of terrible Madden ratings, there's the old um, letter to John Madden. It's like it's got to be 15 years old from Ethan Albright. It wasn't written by him. It was somebody impersonating him, but it was a long snapper that had a terrible Madden rating. It's very, very funny. So if you ever want to go back and just have a a laugh about somebody and Jess talking about Madden ratings, go look up Ethan Albright Madden. Um, The last Madden I played was Madden 19 with a B on the cover. I got a real itch to try to pick it up. It was a terrible game. I played like an hour of it and it just was awful. This year seems to be a little bit better. Uh, I've always been a franchise guy and their franchise mode has been just so neglected. And every year they try to talk it up and so we'll see what happens. But Madden is not the golden age really was, you know, Madden 05 to Madden 07. And lately it's just been a mess. Okay. Uh, so you'll be buying it? No, 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 no. Uh, okay. I might watch it and see how it is, but I don't have much time to, to play Madden in the first place. And the product has been just, so poor, so many microtransactions and focused on just so much, you know, flair and uniforms. And it's just, it's just terrible. It's a bad product. You like playing that, uh, that baseball game online, right? That kind of yeah. like that, that stratomatic t- type of game. I'm showing my age there. You probably don't even, <laughs> you probably don't even know what stratomatic is. Uh, but uh, that that it was big when that 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 game came out when I was a little kid, you know, with the dice rolling and the cards and all like that. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, yeah, it's out of the park. Twenty three. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's like the hardcore baseball sim. Um, and my pirates team is terrible. So I I spent this weekend playing this game, just being mad and frustrated. So the real life pirates and the fake pirates are equally terrible. So that's that's my life. And that's on your your YouTube uh, uh, stream, right? It is. You can find it on my YouTube channel. I post episodes, I don't know, once or twice a week. I'm going to try to be more committed during the season. But right now, uh, the real life pirates and the virtual pirates are pretty hard to watch. All right. What do you think about some of the uh, uh, the Steelers ratings? Wide receiver and tight ends. Right. Yeah. It just I, I hate this slow roll. And I'm sure by the time people listen to this, we'll know TJ Watts. He should be a 99. He better be a 99. Uh, for the receivers, Deontay Johnson, the highest overall rating, 85 overall. I think Pat Frymuth was the second highest rating of the receivers, tight ends at 79. I'm not sure how Zach Gentry has a worse Madden rating than Jay Sternberger, considering <laughs> Gentry played and played well last year, and Sternberger, I don't think, logged a single snap. So it seems like some sort of pedigree bias there. But mm. um, 
I don't know. I mean, I don't really put a lot of stock and, and care too much about it, obviously. All right, but we will pass along that info on SteedersDepot.com today and throughout the rest of these rankings as they come, become available because several people, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, do play that and all. So, uh, all right, uh, the other big news, I think, on Monday was the bottles coming down. Uh, that was kind of surreal to see. I think my biggest takeaway from all that is, Man, those are some big ass bottles. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see them coming down. You see a a regular human uh, next to them, and man, those were some big old bottles. I'm here to tell you, and I, I guess this means that they weren't able to work out. I don't know, so uh, you know, something with 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 Hines, I guess, for the for the red zone. So it's going to be interesting to, yeah. You know, I was holding out hope that maybe they could work out some minor deal with that, at least give give fans that that Hines red zone, mm-hmm. uh, uh, ex- you know, what's been going, you know, experience or or, or or you know, scoreboard and all like that. Uh, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen either. And it, I don't, I don't know. I guess Hines is just going to slowly ride off into the sunset the way it looks like it. I know last week Art Rooney left open the possibility of a deal and the bottle staying up, but that obviously doesn't seem like that's going to happen, at least from the bottle side. I'll be honest, though. I mean, A, obviously we knew like the Hinesfield sign was going to come down and the bottles probably were too. You know, I was a, I was not happy with the name change. I was surprised by it. I'm not a fan of now having to call it Acrisure Stadium until 2036, but I'm kind of over it at this mm-hmm. point. Like I made my piece and yeah, I don't love the name, but it is the name and I think it's kind of been beaten to death about the name change. Yeah, everybody's gotten mad and re-mad at this point, and I'm probably a mad a third time. And uh, now that the shirts have hit the strip strip disc, dis, dis, district and all, uh, that really <laughs> punctuates it at, at this point. Uh, I, I, I think Cam Hayward's done a, a, uh, a fairly decent job of, of doing the Lord's work and trying to – calm calm you know fan fans down when it comes to this and all but look you're either you you know you're probably one of three boats right now you're either mad as hell uh still about it you're either i'm over it or you're you're somewhere in the middle of like whatever you know on that and that's the way it's going to be uh for some time now i, I would be I, i'm glad that they got kind of got these bottles done right away that you know just go ahead and rip the band-aid all the way off at this point uh and all so we can talk about it get past it nothing's going to change sign your petitions do whatever you want to do keep calling it heinz field you know whatever but uh, at some point we we've got to move on from this Right, and I'm firmly in that move on category. I know other fans are not, but you know, I just can only be mad so long and kind of let that thing go. And I promise you, this time next week, no one's going to be talking about bottles and stadium names. It's camp. It's it's evaluation. There'll be much bigger fish to fry, which I think is is exactly what Kim Haywood said. What do you think about what's the deal with the tickets and 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 and, and training camp and how? You know, how are they going to handle that? What if someone went out there and bought a hundred tickets or not bought, but, uh, uh, registered for like 10 tickets and they only use two, you know what I'm saying? Sure. I have no idea. I know they started with, with Hein the camping at Heinz food last year, they required tickets. I don't know if they just kind of carried that over as maybe a semi security safety measure or some way to get a head count on things. I mean, security has been always very lax at Latrobe, but just a couple of hungover college kids there. So I don't really know how official or legitimate it's going to be so all i know is that i got them the second they went on sale and bought them and that's all i care about all right i i just you know are they trying to get a head count or all right. uh that kind of thing so it was a it's been interesting on that uh yeah. so uh just so everybody knows you know before you go out there make sure you do try to can, can you still get can people still get tickets alex or are they quote unquote sold out do you, do you know the status on that I had not checked. I can try to check again here really quick if I can maybe right. pull it up here briefly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it'd be weird if it was sold out because, you know, you can sit in the grass if you want to. It looks like you can still buy. I'm not going to go through the whole process, but I'm still seeing them come up here. So okay. let me just check one last thing. And they are free, right? Yes, they are free. Okay. And that is, I mean, you don't have to, and parking's free. You can go to Latrobe and watch practice and not spend a dime. They do have concessions in a little uh, shop and, and things like that. But, yeah, I mean, it looks as far as I can tell, you can still get tickets. So I think, you know, people want to go. They still can. All right. Good news. 
One other piece of news that came out was, you know, Pittsburgh still has, they love their open roster spots. They will take their mm. sweet time filling the open roster spot they did with uh, Stefan Tua to Ogan Joby. We don't expect an Ogan Joby type of signing to replace the retired Daniel Archibong, but it is reasonable to expect it will be a defense alignment to replace Archibong and not an offense alignment or a running back or other positions that have been speculated about. According to, I believe it was the NFL transaction uh, sheet yesterday, uh, five players working out who played for the USFL this past year, uh, four defensive linemen, and then one kind of edge guy, Doug Costin, Freedom, Aiken Moladen. I'm going to butcher that, so I apologize. Dominique Davis, Andrea Tillman, who's kind of more the edge guy, and Willie Yarberry. And so those are the five that have recently uh, worked out for the Steelers. I assume one of those names will be signed shortly. All right. Did any of them stick out to you? I didn't have a chance to go run down any. Uh, any tape on any of them? Yeah, I didn't watch any tape. I'll just wait for the signing there. Costin has the most accomplished NFL resume. He started nine games. I think it was two years ago for Jacksonville. Has 32 career tackles. The other guys have been more in camps, but not playing a lot. Um, I think uh, Freedom Aiken Mulligan has played a little bit with the Giants, I want to say. Other guys have you know just kind of been part of camp, yet to really see NFL action. Uh, I think Yarberry had four sacks this past year for the Stallions. I, I think a couple of these guys are, are Stallion players, and so that's okay. kind of the team they're targeting the most here. I don't know who's the best. I, I just know the cost and has the most NFL experience. All right, uh, and I still don't think the uh, the Owens kid is signed. I don't think uh, was it uh, Owens? Uh, what was his last name? I'm sorry. I'm, uh, oh, the the edge guy you were talking about. Right. Yeah, um, I don't believe so. But I know you were kind of tracking that and him more than I have. Right, right. I, I haven't I haven't seen where he is signed anywhere. Chris yet. Odom, right? That's his Od- name. Odom, Odom. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, Odom. I know a couple of USFL guys have signed. I think Stribbling in the Corner. Uh, I think his name was whoever the, the MVP was. Darius Victor or Butler. He signed with, with somebody. So a couple of those guys are coming over. Again, it'll just be interesting. Can their body hold up? For, like They're playing football for basically 11 or 12 months. And so you just kind of wonder you know, what they're going to look like in December after playing in the USFL and coming to the NFL and camp and preseason practice, et cetera, the grind of it all for guys who aren't necessarily the top counts in the NFL either. You just wonder how that's going to play out. Yeah. I'm just looking here at Chris Odom uh, and I'm still not seeing any, any new news on him. So, uh, all right. Uh, we'll have to see if uh, that 89 becomes 90 and you would think it would happen sooner rather than later. I would have thought it would happen by now, but obviously before camp. Right. So again, Pittsburgh kind of taking their time there, but uh, expecting it to be a defense lineman to replace the retired Daniel Archibong. Uh, what else do we have going on, Dave? Um, uh, I'm trying to see. I pretty to, slow here. I forgot to see if the uh, salary cap, uh, I know we're waiting for an injury settlement amount at some point here, and it still has not hit. So this team, I believe, is still a little bit more than $14 million under the cap at this point. All right. And do you still, do you still anticipate maybe a TJ Watt restructure occurring during camp or is that really dependent on just whatever course this team? Yeah. I mean, they're right. They're on that mark, right? Where, right. I mean, I, I guess a lot of it might is, is probably going to depend on, 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 on Deontay Johnson, but I mean, they could theoretically, you know, uh, do him and probably still get away with not doing uh, TJ Watt uh, on, on top of it. So yeah, I don't want to say definite one way or the other, but I mean, they haven't done it yet. Doesn't mean they can't, they, you know, they might just wait and see what other needs they have once they get into, into camp and all. And if, you know, God forbid somebody goes down uh, that way. But uh, if I, if I, you know, I'm willing to bet that they're, they're not wanting to have to, you know, uh, uh, restructure Watts contract and have to put money in escrow and that kind of stuff, you know? Okay, so we'll just see what happens there. It's on the table if they need to, like you said. Um, And and also just to kind of briefly talk about some early camp potential happenings. You know, I think a Chris Boswell deal could happen very, very early on in training camp, even as early as maybe the day they report. Right. Um, That's kind of happened before. So I wonder if that's in the works and no one's really talking about it now, but they show up to camp and they report. And then about five o'clock on that Tuesday, a week from now, uh, we'll hear about, you know, Boswell becoming the highest paid kicker. 
Right. And, it, you know, look, you're probably not going to overwork him during camp and the end of preseason anyway. Right. So it's not like you, you got a guy out there that you, you know, you want to wait later on into the process in case he gets hurt. Uh, last I checked, they're not playing at, uh, at the hall of fame stadium. Right. <laughs> so, uh, boy, do you remember that, uh, the whole, uh, Sean Swisham thing and how unfortunate in a, in a, in a dang hall of fame game that you lose a kicker to a knee injury on, uh, like that. Uh, uh, but it could happen anytime. The, the biggest shock will be if we get to week one and, and Chris Boswell does not have, uh, hasn't signed a, a contract extension that, that, that would be the biggest news there. Right. I, I fully expect an extension to happen and probably happen sooner than later. And it is, yeah, it's unfortunate what happened to, to, to Sean Sweezum, but that, that led them to Chris Boswell. They right. went from him to the failed, the, the failed kicker, the West Josh Scobie to Boswell. So it's just kind of crazy how, how all these things in that sense work out. Right. They actually had um, one in between there too, right? That had the groin injury. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? I'm, I, 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 was it Gar- uh, Garrett? Uh, Hartley? Garrett Hartley? Was that it? I, I think that sounds right. All right. That sounds we're, right we're to me as well, there to, too. To get that one. I mean, he had to, uh, he had a, uh, I thought he had a groin injury or something in there. No, you're right. He got hurt. Let me just try to pull up his uh, thing here. Yeah, he was placed on IR on the August 31st, 2015. So, yeah, pulled hamstring okay, during the hamstring. preseason game. All right. I, I remember something like that uh, there happened in there. All right. Uh, what else do we have? I think we should get to our 90 and 30 because we only have a couple of episodes left to kind of finish out the rest of the group. We have quite a number of names to still go over. Um, I apologize. I missed the day of Sesame Street about the alphabet. So I ah. skipped on the fly uh, a couple of the guys in the P's. That's Kenny Pickett, James Pierre, and Carlin's Platel. And we skipped uh, them to go to the R's. So we'll kind of circle back and start with Kenny Pickett here. And obviously that's a guy we're going to talk about plenty come training camp. I'll be asked uh, a million times a day about Pickett. And understandably so. It's the most important question for the future of this franchise. How does Kenny Pickett look? You know, when it comes to rookie quarterbacks, you don't want to get into these, you know, peaks and valleys of he was great this day. He was bad this day. What does it mean for the future? You know, it's really it's not about just what you do in one day. It's about the body of work and the performance over time. So I think there's going to be some caution of don't become a prisoner of the moment about every single snap and rep and play, even though, of course, we'll be talking about it um, and analyzing it. But just pick it showing consistency. And some of those flashes that got him drafted, that's going to be key for him. Yeah, excited to see you know, uh, uh, how Canada, you know, if you're able to pick up on him on the move outside of the pocket, you know, kind, kind of moving the pocket kind of things. And uh, obviously his arm strength, his ability to push the football down the field, uh, be something to kind of kind of look out here for. I think uh, every most everybody is resigned or should be resigned to the fact that uh, at probably at best and boring injury picket at best would probably be the backup uh, to Mitch Trubisky. However, comma, if they keep Mason Rudolph into the regular season, you know, it could be a very good chance. Uh, I mean, it, it really is plausible. The longer that Mason Rudolph stays on this roster, that pick in picket opens up the uh, 2022 season as the inactive quarterback, you know, uh, that is if this team you've you've obviously I think are more on the side of hey you know that that we could see this team only keep two quarterbacks on the on the fifty three man roster now if this was Kevin Colbert's world uh, I'd be more inclined to slam my hand, my fist down and say no way that happens but uh, you know we've already gotten you know, a few different surprises if you will from 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 Omar Khan. Maybe that's a way of freeing up an extra roster spot, especially when they have Chris Oladokun, who you know you would you would theorize wouldn't have any problem getting to the practice squad. Uh, this is a kid that's probably at at best probably going to play. I don't know, hundred snaps in three. No, he probably won't, won't even hit hit a hundred snaps. Will he in three preseason games with Oladokun playing? Let's say he played every fourth quarter. I mean, that's twelve twenty four. I mean, he might not even hit fifty snaps, right? right? It'll be very limited. I, I again, I think the only way they, I think keeping two quarterbacks is possible, but that would be if they trade Mason Rudolph and they don't want to have a little Doken as the number three taking up a spot on the fifty three. If they just if they keep if they don't trade Rudolph, I think they do keep three. Obviously, being Trubisky, Pickett, and Rudolph, we'll see the order of them. Um, I think if Rudolph were to be dealt, not on this team for whatever reason, that's when they would keep two. But 
again, just the reps that everyone's going to get, what kind of reps Pickett will get. He probably will technically open camp as the number three, but I think in situational football, which Mike Tomlin is all about, seven shots, um, you know, third down, two-minute drill, you're going to see Pickett get a lot of reps there to really see how he looks situationally. Uh, what's the biggest thing? I mean, you've been out the camp several times, uh, you know, uh, um, several years uh, over the years. And what what is what is one or two big, big things that you're really, really looking for from Kenny Pickett in person? Well, it's a little weird for me because I've never had to really evaluate a, a fr- potential franchise quarterback before. It was always it was always quarterbacks and young guys to evaluate, you know, Rudolph. Landry Jones, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it was always kind of like, well, Ben's the starter. He's the guy. And so you kind of know what you have with him. Um, I think just doing the simple things first, uh, good exchanges from under center, uh, good handoffs, to the running back at the mesh point, handling some of the motion, the jet stuff. um, That's all going to be really important if you can't do some of those basic fundamental things, because the things that coaches hate the most are the wasted plays, whether it's a bad snap or a bad exchange or, you know, some sort of fumble because it's miscommunication, just a waste of play. You only get 50 something plays in a practice in a day. You got to make all of them count. And so that's kind of the first thing beyond that. Can you look good in that situation of football? Can you perform well in seven shots and drive a team down in two minute drill? Um, You know, usually there's like a minute 40 on the clock. You got one timeout. You got to go 60 yards. Can you execute in those moments when kind of run a bit more than no huddle and muddle huddle and, work things on the fly, but, you know, take care of the football, do the little, the, the little things well, um, be consistent. And if you do some of those things, that's a really good foundation to work off of. All right. You can be chart. You can be charting them, uh, them throws, right? Yeah. Uh, the reps and we'll be talking about the throws and I got some stuff in mind that I want to look for and try to keep an eye on charting this year. So, uh, really excited to, to, dig our teeth into that once camp actually starts. All right. I look forward to, to, to reading and hearing uh, what, what, what you observe out there. All right. Uh, James Pierre, boy, you want to talk about a guy that had a roller coaster ride uh, this, you know, uh, in, in 2021, uh, I, you know, made a 53 man roster all throughout 2021, uh, ended up playing in all 17 regular season games on his way to uh, logging just over 400 snaps at 244 more on special teams. Uh, but I don't think he played uh, in the team's playoff game. However, uh, for the season, he made four starts, 47 tackles. Uh, he went from kind of being a guy on the field quite a bit early in the season. Then he started uh, uh, biting on stuff and, 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 you know, cheating too much into the backfield, giving up some stuff up over his head. And he almost kind of took like a Artie Burns dive, right? Mm. You know, uh, if you will, uh, uh, second half of the season, man, uh, you know, f- really fell out of favor. And I think he failed to log any defensive snaps from week 14 and on. So uh, good special teams player, I think can, 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 can definitely help out there. Uh, just not, not an NFL starter. And he's, you know, I, I view him with, with the look at the depth chart right now that he's, that he's going to make this roster. I'm, I'm fairly sure it's just, he's going to be a depth guy and he, 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 he better make sure that he has Danny Smith's head turn his direction there, because that's going to be the biggest aspect for him. And there's going to be obviously a lot of young cornerbacks trying to get that, I don't know, fifth or sixth cornerback spot, if you will. Going to be interesting to see what happens with Justin Lane, if his special teams ability is enough to help him stick, or maybe one of these younger kids uh, can, can beat out that spot. I don't want to say that James Pierre is 100% locked, but I, at this point, heading into the training camp, I really do view him inside the bubble. He's just got to get better. His recognition's got to be better. And, I, you know, Keith Butler pointed that out, I think, a few times. You know, he just got to understand circumstances, down distance, and what's likely to happen in certain situations. And he just doesn't have a good football sense in that, that aspect uh, of it. And that, that led to him giving up some big plays over his head last season. No doubt. To me, he is someone who is squarely on the bubble and Justin Lane kind of has a bit more teeth in terms of being that special teams guy. You know, Pierre was using in, in, in that phase last year as a gunner on kick cover stuff like that. So he's capable of doing it. But Lane's a little more established, a little bit more proven overall. I'm not giving up on James Pierre. I, I think he's got a lot of the tools, the size. I think he's a better athlete on the field than the way he tested overall. Physical. Um, he, he's a physical guy. Yeah. 
If he plays to run hard, he'll throw his body around and has the size and, and frame to, to be an impactful hitter. But yeah, is, is there that consistency? Is, is the technique, is it weighing at the top of the rack? Thinking about the Bengals game, that uh, touchdown that what T. Higgins, I think, had over him where Pierre's just really just in bad position, never finds the football and just looks really bad because of it, because of it gives up a, a long score. So can it all kind of come together for him? Um, again, I kind of really put him on the bubble because... If you map out 10 defensive backs and let's say your three corners that are definitely going to make it, Wallace, uh, uh, Sutton, Witherspoon, and then you have uh, Minka, Edmonds, that's five right there. I'm going to call Norwood six. Um, and then from there, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Killaboo probably number seven. So then the, the spots start getting kind of thin mm-hmm. for Millette versus Pierre versus Lane versus Casey versus some whatever the unknown uh, is. And so... Not not everyone from that group is going to make it. Absolutely, that's why you know. I personally, I have him inside the bubble, but I, I think he, he you know he obviously can lose uh, his you know lose out to one of the especially one of these younger cornerbacks here. I mean, going to be interesting to see what happens with Lane. I mean, Lane Lane is a good gunner for you, you know. So that's going to have uh, that, that's going to play high into in, into into Danny Smith and what he wants and all like that. But. Uh, uh, this is a guy that you won, you know, you wanted to once you start started seeing the field what you're going to get, you know, and I think it was pretty clear by the end of the season that he had fa- fallen out of favor, at least on the defensive side of football. Uh, he's got to turn that around. He's got to stay healthy throughout camp and he's got to have a real solid summer. And I, you know, I understand that he struggled last year. It was his first year playing on the defensive side of the football. It wasn't a rookie, but what a second year guy. And so you're going to take some of your lumps playing cornerback, but those lumps can't can't reappear this year right especially with, with the big plays and um and that was uh brutal yeah that was uh that was a killer for sure um and then carlin splatel a tryout guy uh signed uh out of rookie mini camp was uh invited to rookie mini camp uh, from south carolina so did well apparently during the spring to to earn a roster spot uh, slot corner uh, it's what he was in south carolina it was like a dedicated you know nickel uh, slot cornerback and so you know, that's going to be really tough to try to get play time and, and, and carve out a role when you have Norwood and Millette and Casey all slot capable kind of guys. Cam Sutton as well. Will he bump inside more this year? I think so, but we'll have to wait and see. So we'll be fighting for practice squad at best talking about Platel, um, but but impactful hitter and, and kind of plays bigger than his size. Yeah, a guy that's physical in a slot. I mean, a guy that's uh, willing to stick his face to the fan, I think, in, 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 in what I've seen on him. Not the most, not the most athletic guy. Right. You know, but I mean, a guy that 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 that's not afraid to be physical in there. It just feels like a lot would have to happen for him to make the uh, to make the 53 man roster Uh, more. uh, You know, more than anything, I think he is competing for a uh, practice squad spot as maybe a backup slot guy. Five elevens, almost five, almost six foot, I guess, uh, 194 pounds. Does he kind of have a William Gay feel to you to him a little bit? I mean, that, I'm not. I mean, as loosely. Yeah, I mean, it's a little more millet ish to me. Okay. I think where he's not a great athlete, probably not going to be a great cover guy, but pretty feisty and plucky, and you know, it's going to come downhill and, and throw his weight around. Um, that's kind of the vibes they get from Car- from Carlin Splatel. All right. Well, Travel Guy played at Assumption College, transferred to South Carolina, um, did okay there. And then, you know, I, I always respect the tryout guys that, that apparently had, you know, turned heads during the summer or during the spring and then, you know, got the chance to go to a, to a training camp. And you've seen that before with Henry Mondo and Terrence Garvin and Duck Hodges, tryout guys that become something. So don't count them out. All right. Uh, the next three Skiba, Scott, and Scott. Mm, the law firm of Skiba, Scott, and Scott. Yeah, Nick <laughs> Skiba, uh, another tryout guy that made the team. Um, well, you could, you camp. called this one right out of the shot, didn't you? That uh, uh, D- Danny Smith showed up, I think, at that Wake Forest mm-hmm. uh, uh, pro day, and a uh, guy that really had a good, good kicking career, I think, overall at Wake Forest, uh, connecting what tw- uh, last season, twenty three of his twenty five, uh, good on all sixty five extra points, extremely accurate kicker, and never missed an extra point. I don't believe in his college career, he hit eighty nine point nine percent of his career <coughs> field goal, excuse me, field goal attempts. Uh, uh, most con- uh, uh, set an NCA record for uh, most consecutive made field goals at one point, making 34 straight. I mean, you kind of saw this one coming here. Is, is him potentially 
I mean, if we can't call them camp bodies, are we allowed to call them camp legs? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, there is this guy named Chris Boswell that we talked about earlier in the show, and he's pretty good, man. Yeah, I mean, Skiba has no chance to make it, barring some sort of you know terrible injury to Chris Boswell. But he was one of the most accurate kickers in college football history. And so I was really surprised he did. He only became a tryout guy and uh, not surprised he's on the, on the roster right now. So he may have a good summer, even if he's not going to win the job. What about chances of a kicker on a practice squad with a 16 man practice squad? Uh, probably not, not in this post uh, COVID kind of world where it's less of an issue. So I don't think, don't think they're going to keep the specialists like they did, you know, last year and in 2020. All right, Scott and Scott. Yeah, the lot they Scott edge rusher played a little bit last year in that Chargers game. Got a cup of coffee, so that experience will probably suit and serve him well. Um, but even though the edge battle behind Watt and Highsmith is very much up in the air, the odds of Scott getting a roster spot out of camp when you do have enough competition and uh, Skipper and Avery and um, Derek Tuska and the undrafted guys Johnson and Moultrie, it it would take a lot for Scott to to make it. Yeah, I think the only thing that this 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 kid can hang his uh, hat on uh, is the fact that he, he was on the practice squad early last season and managed to stick around, right? Uh, former undrafted free agent, I believe, with the Packers in 2020. Uh, just he doesn't pop on tape, you know, at least to me, uh, even in his uh, uh, SMU uh, years. And we've talked several times seems like multiple years now about the the depth and uh, and Steelers at the outside linebacker position. And while it's not great, he's squarely behind guys like uh, Tushka and, 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 and Jannard Avery and, and, and that kind of thing. So, and, and, and it could get worse for him if this team does add another veteran outside linebacker type, you know, before week one on top of it. So, uh, barring some bad things happening, some, some misfortunes happening, uh, during training camp in the preseason, it certainly does seem that he heads to Latrobe, uh, with, with, you know, uh, the battle of, of trying to make the practice squad again. Yeah. It's going to take a lot. Um, going to have to impress on special teams. And even then it may not, may not be enough. So it, practice squad possible, but it'll be a tough road for Scott on the 53. Yeah. You don't normally see a lot of these, these, these outside linebacker guys, uh, and that's where kind of a guy like Tushka has, has, has a hand up on him, uh, really excel at special teams. You know, it's what got Jameer Jones basically yep. kept him around a couple of weeks into the season, uh, last year. So if you're going to be one of those fringe outside linebacker guys, you know, just like the inside linebacker guys, you better be able to, you know, at least get yourself on two special team units. And then Trent Scott signed over uh, this summer, has a good relationship with Pat Meyer, probably a big reason why Trent Scott was signed. He was coached by Meyer both in Los Angeles and in Carolina. Versatile tackle um, and play a little bit of guard as well. So maybe a slightly upgraded version over Chaz Green uh, and probably more so as a run blocker than pass protector. The pass protection has been pretty rough. He's got some really ugly clips out there. And so, you know, could he be a ninth offensive lineman? Maybe, but just does the talent warrant it? Um, probably not. And so he'll compete. He'll kind of be on that fringe ninth offensive lineman practice squad bubble competing with Chaz Green. Uh, but I don't know if that connection with Myers is going to be enough to get him on the 53. Yeah, I mean, he's got the coach kind of in his corner, so to speak there. He's logged uh, a little over 1,600 total offensive snaps. As you said, he's very, very versatile, played every position on the offensive line except for center since uh, entering in uh, the NFL in 2018. I think he's appeared in 53 regular season uh, games to boot, but you know, you're know dealing with one of those jack of kind of all trades, master of none. Uh, what is his single best position? Guard? I view him more as a tackle. Um, I think it's a bit been a, he's had more experience there and it's been more of a natural tackle. So I, I think he's probably going to get most of his work at Left, probably left tackle with Chaz Green or right tackle, if oh, I had to Lord. guess. All right. Uh, That's my guess. Hopefully. Uh, I I saw some interesting snaps with him at guard, but uh, he's he's not, you know, he just, he's in that, uh, he's in that, in, in that category, like you said, with Green and uh, it, he's not even up there with Haig 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think it's not like Hague's going to go to the Pro Bowl anytime soon. But it was an interesting ad when they added him. But uh, I mean, I'm not going to say it's impossible with him because he does have the NFL experience. It'll be interesting to see how many they keep. But I mean, let's face it, we don't we don't want to see this offensive line get into a situation like we saw uh, last season with you know so many bodies coming in there. Now, for the most part, they were able to to keep their tackles clean last year. Uh, uh, They did have uh, uh, Chiquama, I think, miss what? uh, Didn't he miss a game with a concussion, if I remember? Uh, Mm -hmm. And all like that. But the the, the real problems came at the guard positions uh, last year. We don't want to have to get into a scenario where anybody not named Dan Moore, Chiquama, or Corfor have to play meaningful snaps at the tackle position. Sure. As we mentioned on the last podcast, short term, Joe Haig playing for a half a game. That's fine. If it's a longer term thing, this team would probably be wise to try to make some sort of move because you don't want to have to start Joe Haig for six games and certainly don't want Trent Scott playing probably at all. When you say you want some interesting snaps of Scott at guard, is that good? Interesting, bad, interesting. It's kind of like I, I thought I'm there funny. was something. I, no, I, no, I thought there was something okay. there. You okay. know, uh, I, I can't remember. It's been a while, it was, you know, since he signed and all like that. But uh, I kind of in a uh, who was the uh, the uh, the tackle out of LSU, a Hawkins uh, okay. kind of way. I always kind of thought that it w- would have been interesting to see Hawkins play more at guard. You know, that that's kind of the, the feeling that I, I, I'd had with a small section of, of Trent Scott uh, tape that I saw. And the problem is that interior offensive line is so crowded. It's hard to really get get reps there. And he kind of has a bit more of a tackle build. Um, so I think it'll be, you know, you're starting tackles in camp, trying to map this thing out. Dan Moore, Chakuma Kofor, second string. Joe Haig will be probably at left tackle and then at right tackle, either Scott or Green, I guess. I'm missing anybody else to play tackle there. And then I don't even know how third team is going to look right now, but you know, that's kind of a loose way to, to view it. Jake Dixon, I guess, maybe third string somewhere in there. Uh, and I think the Steelers even have Scott, not that it means a whole hell of a lot. I think they have Scott listed as a guard, don't they? Trent Do Scott? they? I honestly have not, did not check, did not pay much attention. Uh, let me look. Uh, I mean, I know he has played guard. I guess I've always I viewed him a, a bit more of a tackle. Um, although I think maybe the skill set would be a little bit better at guard, but okay, it's just I so hard to find. On, the, on the media side, they have him now listed just as an offensive lineman. So okay, uh, yeah, you may see see him move around, but I think tackle is where he's going to play the most this summer. Uh, all right. Uh, going to be interesting to see if they if they do add a better. You know. Uh, Who's the uh, Eric Fisher still out there? I think uh, been a name that's been uh, kind of a guy that people have thought that the Steelers might might pursue that kind of thing. And I think uh, didn't uh, our own Tom Mead uh, write about a few guys that could could make for interesting uh, additions? He did, and Gerald Hawkins was on that list. Funny enough, and he's still in the league, which I had forgotten about. I think he's with maybe the Saints right now. I I don't think this team would add anybody until and unless there's an injury to one of the top three tackles. Uh, And if they did add somebody, more than likely a guy currently on somebody else's roster that maybe fails to make a cut or something. Probably, but good tackles or even like below average tackles don't get cut that often because it's just so hard finding any sort of tackles. There's such a scarcity at the position. So you would you would probably be looking at what waiver wire or maybe signing one of like the Eric Fisher type that that you mentioned. Um, But, you know, yeah, it would it would take an injury. If everyone's healthy, this is the group that they're going to have your top three tackles being more a core four and Joe Hake. All right. Steven Sims next on the list. Yeah, um, I'm sure he did not love the Gunnar Olszewski signing because he All saw right. Ray Ray go and said that door's kind of open and Olszewski's kind of slamming that one shut. Um, he really didn't play at all last year for the Steelers, huh? Oh. Given all the injuries there, it's a little Anthony Miller like this guy can't, you know, get the call up and see the field at all, despite there being an opportunity, at least seemingly an opportunity. So, you know, he, he, the benefit of he's he's had a full off season with the team. He's going to be able to start from scratch, not coming over mid season, which is a little bit tougher catching that moving train stuff like that, but. I'm not really sure what their role is going to be. Probably a little bit of slot work. It'd be as a, a backup return guy, I'm sure, during the preseason and, and, and camp and things like that. But again, that path looking pretty narrow when you have Olszewski, you have Austin, 
uh, Anthony Miller, et cetera. You know, uh, he couldn't be happy about the wide receiver coach change either because mm, uh, I kill your, you know, had spent time uh, over at Washington prior to coming to the Steelers. And we, we, you see this uh, over the years, right? Guys kind of bring some of their guys with them. And it kind of feels now at this point that that was the case. But after all, of that last year with the Juju and the Ray Ray and uh, that kind of stuff. The fact, and uh, the fact that, that Sims couldn't even work himself into just getting any, you know, any kind of scraps was a little bit concerning there. Uh, you know, not, not a huge return guy. Uh, if he was going to make any kind of living, I think in the NFL, it would be in the slot and it, it just seems at this point it was more of a cordial futures contract. Uh, come on back and uh, we'll see how it goes there. So uh, once again, with with with, with Frisman Jackson taking over for for for, for I Killyard uh, in that room, man, I think Sims really has an uphill battle. I mean, obviously, uh, you know. You, kind of seems like an afterthought for the for the 53 that a lot would have to happen there but even for the practice squad at this point might they go a different direction maybe with some of these younger guys because you know the sims can really give you anything on special teams outside of return i mean obviously it'd be nice to have a guy that can return Mm -hmm. but they're probably going to have a lot of guys that oh yeah he can do this if we needed him to It, it it just to me the whole I kill you out the door doesn't doesn't spell well for Sims, especially with him not being able to get much of any, any scraps last year. Sure. I think it's a really good point um, that that guy that was probably going to be a bit more in his corner, know him a little bit better is no longer with the organization. I mean, Sims has worked on special teams before he had a kick return touchdown back in 2019 and he's done kicks and punts. And there's some value in that because a lot of guys can only do one, just kicks or punts doing both. There's a different skill set required for each role. And so having keep being capable of doing both, I I think is important. So he may be kind of on the practice squad as a backup to gunner, should he get hurt, but that path for the 53 because of the Olszewski signing who can also do kicks and punts um, really kind of closes that door unless there's a, an injury, of course. Uh, played all of five offensive snaps last year as an elevation in that uh, week 10 game. Was that the Lions game? I think it was. Uh, did not register any any stats whatsoever. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I think he could be practice squad. You know, as you said, the young guys how they perform well or or not well may kind of ha- you know determine what happens with Sims. But I could see him on the practice squad as that backup because really, who are your other return options? I mean, there are some names you can throw out there. A little bit of Calvin Austin in the punt return game. McFarland probably gets some kick return looks, but there really aren't a lot of other great firmly established return capable guys. We all know that Mike Tomlin refuses to put a defensive player out there. Okay. So, I mean, it see. could go either way with him. We're not going to be surprised if he makes it or doesn't make the practice squad. Right. But 53, very narrow, narrow. It, it, Something, something has to happen. <laughs> yeah. Either Oshevsky has to get hurt or have some serious ball security issues to get him off the roster. Right. Tuzar Skipper, third time to charm for Tuzar Skipper, um, you know, signed this off season as Pittsburgh, doing the Dave Bryan plan of adding as many edge rushers as possible and, and seeing what all sticks and hopefully Skipper sticks this time around. It's going to require him doing more on special teams than he did his first stint. He just didn't get used there until very late in the summer and just didn't really have enough value there to justify the roster spot. Um, and so, you know, we'll see what he looks like this time around. I'm just, I just wonder what the Steelers are going to be looking for differently this time from Skipper that can help him get on the roster and right. stick finally. Right. And, and, and we're talking multiple times here. Now they know him that he knows them at this point. And look, yeah, you, know, you go back to that rookie season of him and there were some flashes with him as a pass rusher, but that's, that's kind of where it ended. And the giants tried to, to work with him a little bit, uh, obviously after, after, uh, getting plucked from the Steelers and it never, never came to fruition there. He went over to the team, like the Titans and bounced bounced off and on. I think that uh, uh, roster and practice squad quite a few times, uh, even spent a little time uh, with the Falcons last uh, summer before signing back with the Titans. Uh, 
it just feels like this, this clock's really, really ticking on him at this point. As we just mentioned uh, a little bit early and running down some of these players, uh, if you're going to be like the number four, or number five outside linebacker on this roster, you better, you better, you better have uh, Danny Smith's attention. You know, and, right. and, and and it really is that simple. Uh, it makes it easy when you look like a, at a guy like Derek Tuska because that guy kind of can be that guy, right? Uh, and we did, while it wasn't much, we saw some, at least Tuska in the pass rushing department making a, a, a move forward uh, uh, later last season there. Uh, it, it, if one of the, it makes you wonder if one of these guys like TD Moultrie or Tyree Johnson, what are those guys really, if they can't beat out a guy like Tuzar Skipper and, and, you know, all apologies to Tuzar Skipper, but you know, how bad are those guys in Tyree Johnson and TD Moultrie if they can't beat, beat out a guy like Skipper for like either a fifth, fifth uh, outside linebacker spot or, or, or a practice squad spot. Sure. I mean, Skipper, as you said, had a tremendous first summer with the team. He was that camp darling and he was just excellent. Impre- impressive pass rushing snaps in, 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 in several of those preseason games. Yeah, I, I guess the the biggest change from then until now is just maybe the opportunity. It's less settled. And I forget exactly what the linebacker room looked like at the time. But this time around, you know, there, there's not even a Melvin Ingram who's going to have, you know, a clear number three spot. You know, Avery is probably going to make it, but he's not as secure or as talented as Melvin Ingram was last year. Right. So really, there's just more of an opportunity for that pass rush number three outside linebacker on this team behind Watt and Highsmith. And that may be the biggest difference in Skipper's favor this time around. You know, you kind of wonder, you know, could, could this be a guy <laughs> you harken back? I mean, to, to the old James Harrison of bouncing off and on and all like that is obviously a lot different time. This guy's got to come out with all guns blazing. I mean, he, he's got to be a guy, especially on the defensive side of football, that's unblockable in camp in the preseason. He's going to need another five sack preseason. I think to uh, to stick around, and once again, obviously, you got to show up on at least on a couple of those the the the, the, the those, those special teams uh, units. There, it feels like he's got one foot out of the league right now, though. Yeah, um, the thing with Harrison, and I know that you know this, is that he stuck around because what he did on special teams, right? And I mean, that's what, Murder, what his role was early. People, yeah, yeah, and then Joey Porter gets kicked out of a game and then Harrison gets inserted. And that's kind of where things started for him of, of seeing what he could do defensively. So again, there is an opportunity for Skipper because the depth is, is so, you know, we don't know who the backup linebackers are going to be behind the, the two edge guys. And so there is an opportunity there. I think Tuska is safer than people think because of the special teams value that he brings and Avery Skipper probably won't have that level um, on, on that team's units. Um, but we'll just have to see and, and Skipper again, this is, this is last chance for him. You look at that whole room in general behind Watt and and, and uh, Alex Highsmith, and it's it's like deja vu all over again. You know, uh, yeah. I'd love, and once again, apologies to to the Gennard Avery fan club. I I was you know uh, firmly in the Gennard Avery fan club when he came out of Memphis once again, but I, I liked him as as an off the ball guy. You know, more so than. Uh, then is it can can Jannard Avery kind of be that maybe that uh, uh, ninth or tenth? Not technically, but you know what I'm saying. Kind of be that guy that 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 maybe allows you to only carry four inside linebackers. Um, I mean, he's able to play either spot. Somebody uh, Falcon safeties, or we really appreciate his comments on the site. Kind of, he he made the comparison between Jannard Avery and Arthur Motes, which I think has some merit to it. I think Avery's a little different build wise, but I get in terms of being like a I think Avery's dude. better in space than than Motes was personally. You think? I don't yeah. know. I think eh, I don't know how I feel about that one, but I, just in terms Avery's of like overall, better all, I think Avery is better than Motes was off the ball. Yeah, moving in space. Okay, that's fair. Um, but I, the idea of just being this kind of veteran guy, a little bit of a journeyman, play can play the edge, can play off ball, that's a little bit of the feel there in terms of like what he brings to the table, broadly speaking. Remember when they had uh, Moats move Moats back in? Um, <laughs> After, yeah, the injury to Shazier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Sean Spence, and they don't play LJ Ford. Yeah. Good Lord. Uh, 
long story short, that I, I think they need to do something at the outside linebacker position. And and we'll see, you know, someone not named Taco Charlton, you know, uh, uh, and we'll see if somebody gets cut. That, that that's probably the only way that's going to happen is get somebody uh, somebody currently under contract with another team that uh, could fit in as your backup to to uh, Watton and high. Who who is your guy right now? Who is the first guy off the bench of for Watt or, or Heisman? It has to be Avery, right? It does. I would say Trenard Avery right now. But again, you bring all those guys to camp. You see what sticks. You hope that one or two. All you really need is one guy to. St- to stand up and or, or stick out, I should say. Um, because if Tuska's your number four and special teamer, I think you're good with that. If just one of Skipper and Avery and Moultrie and Johnson can establish himself as a number three, you know, defensive piece to rotate in and play 25 snaps a game, then then I think you're fine. All right, let me ask you a question. If Tuzar Skipper makes the 53, will you be shocked? Uh, what odds did I, I think I gave him a 40% chance in my deconstructing the Steelers roster. Okay. And so I, so That'd I guess no. short answer. That, no. Yeah. I mean, no, right. I would not be shocked if he's at 40%. All right. What if, uh, how shocked would you be if Tuzar skipper, uh, doesn't make the practice squad? Uh, not, not very. I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, either he's making it or he's not at this point. Don't keep this guy around and just hang around on the practice squad. You know, when he's failed to make the roster like three times now. So, I mean, it all just depends on how other guys look. But I think it's kind of either like, you know, pain or get off the ladder. Either you're part of this team and you're making an impact or it's just not going to work out. And we're going to go find somebody else who can who can make it work. Uh, so poop or get off the can, right? Yeah, I was trying to do the <laughs> the uh, PG version of that. My, my old man drilled that into me at <laughs> an early age. Uh uh, I guess what I'm getting at is it could go any different direction with him this summer. So I'm guessing you would not be shocked on either of those questions you asked none, me making the none. roster. Yeah, which uh, is a it, crazy range. Yeah, right. It, it is quite a range, but it just it, it does feel like, right, you, you know, the drill here. Let's see what you got. You know? Yeah, right, right. For sure. So uh, last player to look at from this uh, list of names here, Tyler Sneed, another tryout guys. I love I love talking about the tryout guys that get on the roster and, and just are scratching and clawing Tyler Sneed from East Carolina. He had I had more people comment about Tyler Sneed than any other tryout player during rookie minicamp saying this wow. guy's legit. This guy's the real deal. And they they were obviously right to some degree uh, because he made the teams on the 90 man uh, roster. He's going to be more of a slot guy. Um, and he may be someone I bet you. At least before the pads come on, those first couple of days when it's a little bit more just on air and it's even less physical um, than usual, Snead's going to make a couple of plays in the slot. I think he's going to get a, he's going to have like at least one day where we're just I'm coming back from camp and we're on the podcast and you're going. So Alex sounds like Tyler Snead had a great day. Like it's going to be I think one of those days will happen this year. All right, uh, he did also return kick and punts. Uh, I believe uh, in 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 college had two hundred one passes for two thousand three hundred eighty yards and eighteen touchdowns. And uh, I think he measured in at uh, you might be taller than than, than mm-hmm. t- Tyler Sneed, five foot six and uh, six eights, right? One hundred seventy two pounds. I, th- I don't think you go one hundred seventy two pounds though. And I wish I was five eight. <laughs> that uh, that hurts me when I'm uh, taller than than a five eight dude. What what do you tip the scales at these days for the ladies? Like, yeah, oh, this this is gonna hurt me more than it's gonna help me. So thank you, Dave. Uh, five 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 six on a really good day. Wear an extra pair of socks, maybe. It's not impressive. All right, what's the weight? Uh, I'm not. I'm trying to to be a little bit more like healthier and in shape. So I've been doing like a daily weighing thing. I think today I was at one thirty five point four. Oh so. Lord, I'd have to cut off one of my two, <laughs> one of my legs. <laughs> oh, you're not a big guy. I mean, you're a bigger nah, guy than me. Nah. But you're not. I yeah. used to be when I, when, it, when I was uh, 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 growing up. I was like 128 pounds for the longest time. Uh, 28 inch waist, uh, 128 pounds. Then I then I got into that. Uh, the next stage I, that I went up was into that 132, 135. Uh, uh, pound range, but uh, 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 father time caught up finally caught up with me. Mm. Uh, so, all right, well, back to Tyler Sneed here. Um, again, the path of the 53 pretty narrow, but I could see practice squad. I think he'll have a good camp. Uh, seems to be a pretty savvy slot guy with good experience, good production. So, we'll see. Yeah, look, uh, more shifty than he is fast. 
Yeah, what did he run? He didn't run a great four, 40. Four, six something, I think. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I think I think you're accurate in that assessment. Uh, I mean, it's going to be it, it seems next to impossible for him to make the 53. So once again, you're you're looking at a guy that uh, maybe is your practice squad slot slash kick returner type. Uh, it seems like uh, he's not going to be big enough to help you on any other special teams units or anything like that. Uh, there. So if the Steelers keep two wide receivers on their uh, on their practice squad, it seems like he he'll be battling for one of those spots unless, you know, unless he just out gunners gunner, you know, uh, uh, and by that, I mean, if you're the guy that takes two or three two two or three to the house dur- during the pre or you know, a one or two to the house during the preseason, maybe he could be that guy. Did he do punts in college? It feels like he might. I thought he did in that mix. Um, I'm trying to remember back about that. It feels like he's going to get some work on, on the return. He'll be in the return line for sure. Uh, yeah, he did kicks and punts uh, a little bit. So it's I actually did two kick return touchdowns. So I uh, should get some work there this summer. There will certainly be some people on Twitter saying he's the next Wes Welker. Mm. If he's short and white and slow. And so that makes you Wes Welker in today's world. All right. Uh, Dave, do you want to do maybe one more here? We don't have a whole lot else to talk about, and we okay. have uh, several more of these 90 and 30s to get through. So moving on here with Benny Snell Jr. I, I know that a lot of people are not fans of Benny Snell, and I understand his upside as a runner is very much capped. He is who he is, but I'm comfortable and okay with him making the team as the number three because he's a really good special teams guy and just has at least some experience and in a room that – has a lot of questions behind Najee Harris. It's hard not seeing this guy make the team. People not going to want to hear it. You know, I, there, there's more. There's not a lot of people in the Benny Snell football fan club, but I tell you one person who is in that fan club, and that's Mike Tomlin. And Danny uh, Smith. And Danny Smith. And, you know, like it or not, it's, uh, I think it would take a lot for Benny Snell not to uh to make the 53 man roster even if the even if the Steelers bring in you know everybody calling for this team to sign a a a a a a uh kind of more accomplished you know backup running back even so uh I I think they like uh Benny Snell enough that he would still make it as as say your number three running back at that point because he'll he he does his his special teams play is above average Okay. And, uh, you know, he, he's got some experience in the backfield. He's not dynamic, obviously, but he's been around long enough. He just seems like a Mike Tomlin, uh, type of player. And the only way he doesn't, I think is if he does something kind of stupid off the field or something like that, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, that, that gets him kicked off the roster. But, uh, and, and I know it's not going to be popular us saying that, but, once again, I, I think this comes down to Mike Tomlin's a Benny Snell football guy, and it would be a to me, uh, it would be a bit surprising if he's not on this fifty three, at least where we sit right now. If you could theoretically have a running back room of Najee Harris, Najee Harris as your number one, a more defined true running back as your number two, be it Anthony McFarland, someone off the street, whoever, and then Snell as your number three. That's a pretty good running back room. I, think. I don't. I don't think that's awful because once again, you're you, you're justifying uh, Snell having the helmet every week, regardless, right? Yeah, yeah, because he's going to be. You know, I, I, would you call him a core guy? I mean, his his snap count was pretty high. In it was teams. it was up there. Why did what what I have in the? Uh, hold on here. Let me let me see what I have in the post here. Uh, it was up there. Uh, Three hundred and twenty six. Yeah, sixty-seven percent according to PFR. That's that's that's, that's a core lot. special team status. Yeah, that's four teams right there. Yeah, yep. for sure. Uh, and he, 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 I think he made a few plays too, didn't he? Yeah, I mean he's he's done well again. I I really respect the guy because he was you know the big man on campus at Kentucky. He was one of the best runners the SEC's seen in the last I don't know fifteen years. Kentucky beats Florida for the first time and almost 40 years to one year and, and snow was a big part of that. And then he goes to the NFL and cuts his teeth, running down kicks and punch, doing all the grunt grunt work and dirty work. And that's not an easy transition. And some guys really 
you know, have an ego too big for some of that stuff. And Snell does not. And so you have to give the guy props for that. And he is a, a good special teams player. And, and that's kind of what his role has become. And that's why he's going to make this team again. I tell you, he's, uh, uh, he, 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 he reads his own press too. <laughs> evidently, <laughs> uh, he plays with a big chip on his shoulder right now. But once again, I, I think he's, it would take a lot for him not make the 53 man roster. Yeah. But again, I would, I would greatly prefer him as the number three, the number two in terms of what, you know, in terms of rushing production, he'll give you his career average is three and a half yards of carry. And I guess some of that is, you know, offensive line fault and stuff like that. But some of that's on his own style. Uh, he averaged 2.7 last year, 3.3 in 2020. I don't know exactly what his run success rate is. It's probably not great. And not so great, he's best yeah. as the number three. All right. Robert Splane. Merrill, yeah. H- Merrill Hodges, man. <laughs> yeah, should be the MVP of the league in, in Merrill Hodges' eyes, but should be the number three inside linebacker on this team. I think Pittsburgh does like his run defense, his downhill mentality, his physicality, of course, the special team shoes. That's again how he, you know, started his NFL career, at least in Pittsburgh. So I know it's there's uncertainty behind the starters in Devin Bush and Miles Jack, and there's uncertainty with the starters in, in Devin Bush as well. But uh, Spillane should make this team as that first man off the bench behind. Uh, those two guys that said we don't want to get back into a situation where we're seeing Robert Splain play a lot of snaps and we certainly don't want to see him in the slot I don't want to see him in dime packages either I still cannot for the life of me understand why Pittsburgh was trying to justify legitimately playing Spillane in dime defense last year and they were saying it was because he's a good blitzer but they, they never blitzed him he just was a coverage linebacker and so that was a really strange decision Robert Spillane is the defensive version of Benny Snell, right? Exactly, 100%, for sure. So it's funny that they're, we're, we're, we're doing a one-two together. Spillane's another guy to give you 120% on special teams. Just, I mean, look, it, it, this guy is just a good dude. You can't help but root for him because of that. But there are limitations, obviously, in, 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 in his game. Uh, assuming he does make the 53 and plays it out and all like that, this is probably... This is probably going to be it for Robert Splane. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, who knows? I think he can have his value and and maybe resign. You said he's a free agent. Yeah, he's a free agent after this year, right? Right. He was back as uh, an RFA again RFA. this year, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you he'll never be, know. He'll be, he'll be unrestricted next next year. If he did come back, so if some man we're, we're way ahead of ourselves here, it would probably be on a uh, uh, veteran benefit, yeah, you know, uh, type type deal. And let's see if you can make the team type type of situation. It's so funny that you compare Snell and Spillane because they are like very similar dudes. Other sides, uh, other side of the ball, right? Um, and, and they had they had like grandfathers that played in the NFL too, or mm-hmm. some relationship. Johnny Leitner and then Matt Snell for Benny Snell. And so I think those guys might have played against each other or something like that. So it's just funny to see how that all worked out. All right, uh, Chris Steele, guy that's kind of intriguing prospect, right? You know, uh, 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 when you look at the uh, look at the undrafted guys, they're you know, and once again, don't call them camp bodies. But uh, if you look at at the list of, of this year, the guys that you would think to have the highest pri- uh, probability of making the 53 on the offensive side of football, for me, that guy would be um, um, Mateo Durant. And on the defensive side of football, uh, maybe Chris Steele. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that had big pedigree when he went to actually went started at Florida and was like a five star recruit. I think had 51 offers coming out of high school. So one of the top recruits in the country. And then he transferred. I don't think he ever played at Florida. Um, There's a and I don't want to get all the details wrong here, but there was some situation where he wanted to change roommates because the guy he was rooming with was accused of like sexual assault or something like that. And it was a big story there ends up transferring to USC had an okay career there. When I watched his tapes, I did the report on him. I didn't come away super impressed. I think he's kind of been a little bit of that pedigree thing. That's kind of what's got him to kind of hang around, but I just didn't see any like super great defining trade. His hands are decent, I think overall, but um, is he going to be a great you know level uh, cover corner? Probably not. Is he a great run defender? Not really. And so I'm not really buying Chris Steele, but I'm happy to be wrong about that. All right, can he make an impact on special teams? Once again, we already talked about Pierre and Lane and and those kind of guys already are 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 in Danny Smith's pocket, so to speak. So a guy like him would have to make sure he pays attention in those rooms for sure. 
Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, getting reps and, and, and reps will be just tough to come by in general for the position that he's in in the pecking order right now. But maximizing those opportunities and giving yourself more, um, I think, will be really key overall. But of the guys of the undrafted guys, is this a guy that, you know, like Mateo Duran on the offense side of the ball, you know, has a better chance than most of them? I don't know. I mean, I have to get eyes on some of these guys. I feel like the edge rushers might because there just might be more of an opportunity there. I mean, outside corner, you know, you have Sutton and you can play inside and out. Wallace, Witherspoon, Pierre, Lane. Where does a Chris Steele potentially fit into all of that? All right. So I, I did more than likely, obviously, it's going to be practice squad for him if, yeah. if, he, if he hangs on. But to your point, talent's talent. And even if you get squeezed out numbers game, you still might show that talent and, and turn some heads and make yourself a difficult, difficult cut. So we'll just have to, to see how he looks. All right. All right. That'll probably be a good good time to, to stop at 90 and 30. We're getting we're getting pretty close here, I think, to to the end. So we should wrap this thing up before camp starts uh next week. Anything else to talk about, Dave? Ryan Switzer announcing his retirement, um, citing injuries. I know we just recently had ankle surgery. He's been on IR, I think, the last couple of years in Cleveland. And so I think uh, injuries you know, ending the career for him. Yeah, I thought he just had surgery again recently, right? Uh, yeah, it was the ankle. Said, yep. Yeah, with the, with that ankle and all. And uh, yeah, look, scrappy guy, you know, hung on a couple of years there and uh just was never really dynamic enough. Uh, you know, average yards, uh, uh, average depth of target and all like that was never great and bounced around a couple of teams there. So, you know, kudos to him, you know, to, to, to play the amount of snaps that he actually didn't end up, uh, 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 playing in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, his route tree was very short in Pittsburgh. I think he still owns the the quote unquote record for the lowest yards per catch of anybody with 50 career receptions, mm. but some of a little bit of that was usage. Um, but you know, made it in the NFL and most guys can't say that. So kudos to him and a really good community member and his son is healthy. You know, his son had the health scare last year. So yeah. all good there. Yeah. And I think he's going to try to go into coaching or some, some aspect or at least stay close to the game. So a good guy all the way around, wish him the best. Every time I look at Switzer, this this has made me um, showing my youth, and I'm going to make you feel old here. You don't know who the professor is, do you? The basketball, like streetball dude, the professor. No. Go watch him. He's pretty He's pretty entertaining. But I think the, pr- 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 the professor and Switzer always feel like the same dude to me. All right. Uh, yeah. How about we get to some emails? Uh, one from Paul Brown here, Benny Snell football and other running backs. He says the last podcast posed the question of which training camp story intrigued you the most. I find myself really invested in the backup running pos- back position uh, to Najee Harris. Needless to say, it doesn't look great at the moment. He says Tomlin preaches Benny Snell football, but looking at his rush success rate of 32.4% overall in 2000. 21 is that something to be proud of it's not sunshine and rainbows with anthony mcfarlane uh jr blah 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 still we don't uh, fully know who anthony mcfarlane is uh he says my suggestion is uh mateo drant see a huge bulk of carries in the preseason with mcfarlane sharing snaps and have the battle for running back two. the students know who benny snow is and it's not a viable option Running back two, but his special teams value is unquestioned. He gets a roster spot. He says, uh, Paul goes on to write, it's a battle between for running back two between Durant and McFarlane. And excited to see what comes out of that. Uh, he says, feel free to disagree. I just don't like the idea of Benny Snell filling in for Najee and rotational snaps, especially when Rooney came out and said, fix, fix, and run, fix the running game. Paul, I, I, I get you, but it goes back to what we said. A lot of, you know, I in the perfect world, yes, Benny Stell's your number three, and I think that's kind of what what Alex and I just recap when we talked about Benny Snell. But are you are they going to bring you know a Mateo Durant? Can a Mateo Durant or McFarland do enough at least by week one if they don't bring in an out an, an outsider to be be the next guy off the bench? I I kind of doubt it. I mean, even even if a guy like Mateo Durant makes the team, you know, that would probably mean that McFarlane doesn't. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, is he going to be able to do enough by week one to be the first guy off the bench? And I I, I kind of find it hard to fathom. 
I mean, those spots would have to be earned. Like if Durant makes it, it's because he really played well. And we're all impressed by the X number of plays he made during the summer. And same with McFarland. None of those spots are guaranteed assured. No one's on scholarship. And so you better have a really strong summer. So those guys will be given the chance. I don't think, you know, and Jalen Warren's there as well. And, and Warren's kind of fits the mold of the bigger type of back that Pittsburgh typically gravitates towards. So I don't want to forget him in this conversation either. I mean, no one's going to come in and like be, you know, given a million snaps right away. But if they play well, they will earn more playing time. That's how it works. It's one step at a time. You have a good practice. You're going to get more reps and you build off of that. The other thing to consider too is Najee Harris probably not touching the ball too much to training camp. They know what they have in Najee Harris. He's not the need to prove himself the way that he needed to prove himself last year. I bet you uh, $5, Dave, Najee Harris does not get tackled once this, this training camp. They will not put him in any of the live contact drills because they know He's going to be a 300 you know, plus carry near 400 touch guy in this summer. And they don't need to waste uh, the tread on his tires, getting tackled in a, you know, live contact drill in, in La Tropia. Yeah. Look, uh, 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 the emailer made a good point, obviously. I mean, they, they know who he is at this point. Right. right. And so that'll be even more chances for the other running backs to find out more about them and give them, more playing time, more snaps, and more reps overall. And so that'll be good for them. But if, if none of these guys can really earn and cement and plant their flag and, and say, you know, I am I deserve the spot, then this team could, should, and probably will go outside the organization because it will not be that hard to find a more veteran type running back, especially come cut down time. Right. So that's where we're at. I mean, if Durant makes it, that means he's really earned it. McFarlane makes it, it means he's really earned it. And that means a lot of good things have happened along the way. All right. Uh, let's see here. Where, let's get to another email from Richard Jamison. Right. Saying, I appreciate your analysis on the deep pass completions by Mitch Trubisky. I would appreciate some further analysis to what extent is Trubisky passing dependent on how well the offensive line protects him. Some quarterbacks do well enough. They have, they have really good protection while other quarterbacks can cover for a weak offensive line. Uh, where does Trubisky stand in that spectrum? I mean, uh, uh, for the most part, it seemed like Trubisky, I, I think he definitely needs play action as part of that, you know, to help kind of freeze things. But like any like any NFL quarterback, I I really think that whether or not they're able to run the football well is going to play a, a, a big part in that. If they're able to 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 run the football uh, right out of the chute, that should help loosen things up there. I'm, I'm trying to think which way he's trying to go here overall, though, with that, Alex, because I mean. I, is he too dependent on on the offensive line being a, there's not at least in the 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 deep passes that I saw on on the recent you know group of 2018 tape that we saw there was only one extended play in there good point yeah i mean obviously you want your offensive line to block well that's that's my high end analysis the the better they block the better everyone else is going to look and play uh typically the quarterbacks who are able to perform well despite bad offensive lines are the ones who just have super high end talent. The Mahomes, Josh Allen, just elite quarterbacks who are better than most other quarterbacks at every aspect of the game and the position, or the guys that have really high end mobility that can extend the play and you know make things happen with their feet. Trubis, he can run, he can move. You know, it, it, it's it's functional and probably a bit better than that. But um, let's just say I, it's not going to go well for Trubisky if this offensive line does not block well. Right. Uh, he says, to what extent is Trubisky's passing dependent on how well the offensive line protects him? Well, I mean, obviously, the more time that, that you get, you know, the better for a quarterback. But, you know, in today's NFL, you better have that football out, you know, 3.2 seconds, right? Yeah, and, and it probably even less than that. I think that's like on the really high end of holding on to the football. And that's something Kenny Pickett, I think, will have to work on. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to really answer that answer this offensive line needs to block better both as a run blocking unit and pass protection um if they don't do well then it's going to be a long season all right uh let's get to i think we got one long we got a book in here from uh brett niles got a i'm not going to read all of it but he's got a bone brett you got to do better buddy i mean I, I we appreciate your comments but you've got four bullet points in here and it's like 600 words in here 
Uh, Alex said he thinks uh, this is about ladder milk. He's got a bone to pick with you about ladder milk. Join the club. No one likes my ladder milk takes. Uh, said he thinks his Alex said he thinks his ceiling is a rotational defensive man. With all due respect, that is his floor. He says I say that because that's what he was last year. He was in that role last year, and as Dave said, and that's what I saw as well that has good tape against run. I, I don't think Alex has ever dis- disagreed that, that, that a lot of Scott got had, had better tape against run. Uh, anyway, uh, to be honest, what I saw last year was better than a lot of backups that I've seen over the years. He says to me, to me, his ceiling is the guy he's behind Chris Wormley, a good run stuffer with limited pass rush ability. <laughs> Isn't that kind of what you've defined him as though, Alex? It, it is, and that's what I've called them. And if you can't rush the pass in today's NFL, you are a rotational run stuffer. I mean, that's going to be your ceiling. R- rushing the passer is a requirement if you want to be an every down, you know, nickel package kind of dude. And the run defense has some work to do as well. I mean, there were moments where it looked all right last year, but this team was 32nd in run defense. Someone had to struggle, and Mata Milk was part of that. And, and yeah, he was part of that rotation last year because he had to be. This team had no other choice. They were losing everybody left and right. And so this guy was pressed into action, ready or not. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, I think this guy could still make the team, and, and and that's certainly possible. And he'll be better this year. He'll be stronger and more technical against the run. But can this guy rush the passer? If the answer to that is no, then your upside is inherently going to be pretty limited. All right. He says, second, Alex said he can get to the practice squad. I'll just say no way. He's got a year of pretty good tape and is, is, and is cost contained for three. If you cut him, he's playing in Baltimore or Cincinnati or Arizona. He's not a seventh rounder who, who never played down. You can probably get or uh, could get Adams to the practice squad. If that's your goal, he says, uh, that's where the Steelers got him from. If you're cutting louder milk, uh, you better plan to lose him. I never said he would get to the practice squad. I never even commented on his practice squad potential or what he get there. So I'm not sure where that's coming from. All right. He says, if you're cutting louder milk, you better plan to lose him. Third, uh, the first two are more opinion. He says uh, this last statement was the most egregious. Alex tossed out Marcus Allen as a comparison. I think that idea was that uh, Allen went to the practice squad in his second year. However, Allen had very limited playing time in his first year, and the tape uh, he did have was terrible. He looked like he couldn't play safety, which ended up being true. Is Alex going to compare the first year of tape of louder milk to Marcus Allen? If he is, then Dave may need to fire him on the spot. Good Lord. Now that's wow. a little hyper hyper bully, he says, but the basic point uh, still stands. There is no comparison in my eyes. And I suspect in Dave or I, what, what did, I don't, I'm trying to recall what you said about a Marcus Allen comparison. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I don't really remember saying that. I mean, I referenced the fact that Allen had made it there, I think his second year um, after getting cut, after making the team his first year. I again, I don't remember any of these things I'm talking about, like Marcus Allen making get making that comparison there. I'm going back. I'm guessing this was on my comments about deconstructing the Steelers roster, calling him on the bubble. I'm trying to go back through my comments here, seeing where I even said anything remotely, you know, comparing him to Marcus Allen. Um, but I've not really made any sort of commentary. They, they may very well lose a lot of milk and get claimed because of the body type is 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 pretty uncommon. So I mean, I don't I don't think that at all. Uh, I mean, people know my thought. I, I was, I was surprised at what they got out of louder milk last year. Now, now, most of it obviously being against the run, you know, but I thought there was enough there that I found myself rewinding the tape a couple of times with him against a run, nothing else, but against a run. And that, yeah. and that's where I am. I, 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 I think he's got to, if he's going to be anything in this league though, he just cannot hang his hat on on being a guy that, 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 that's good against the run. Uh, he's got to have some, he's got to get better as a pass rusher. And you've said that for a while and maybe he will look, I, we didn't even think he, I didn't think he's going to play the snaps that he's going to play last year. And he did. Well, yeah, the injury has forced their hand again. It wasn't, right. it wasn't 100% because like he forced his team's hand and his, his play was like, they had, they had no other choice. They had to play him, but he's got to get, he's very robotic. Uh, he uses his hands, but he stays tied up. Uh, and doesn't get off uh, of, 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 you know, as, as a pass rusher, uh, he's got to come up with a long arm or, or I mean, he's, and he does have a pretty decent long arm if I remember, but it's not something, it's not like a go-to dominant Cam Hayward 
long arm, right? Yeah, he's got to be a power rusher, someone that collapses the pocket. He was trying cross chops and finesse moves last year. He's never going to win that way. Just be Cam Hayward and, and try to push the pocket. All, again, I'm trying to think where, where all this is coming from. Um, what I said in my deconstructing uh, series, I wrote, and I, put, I gave Latimoke a 55% chance to make it. That may be a little bit low, but it, it, it's better than 50, so it's still putting him inside looking out. But I wrote, Latimoke's number may look a little low, but he's my odd man out if the team stays with its history and keeps six defense alignment. Of course, injuries may take the decision out of the team's hands. If, if, if they only keep six, which is what they've always done, someone's not going to make it. Someone's going to be odd man out, and you're going to make you're going to have to make a tough cut there. Now, again, injury may solve this thing. They may keep seven. That is certainly possible as well. Um, but if you had to put somebody at the bottom of the list, someone's got to be there, and I put Latimoke there. Okay. Hey, boy, yeah. he came hard after yeah. you after Loudermilk. But yeah, I mean, I, I never said like he would go to the practice squad or make it there or talked about Marcus Allen. I'm, I'm not even sure where those things are coming from. Um, so I don't I don't think those are accurate. All right. Uh, let's see here. I think we have some breaking news here with the uh, edge rushers here, right? You I'm looking at Madden? Twitter right now. I am not currently, but I'm sure it's buried in some. Some tweets somewhere. Uh, looks like uh, TJ Watt. I'm not seeing anything on Madden's account. Oh, they're, they're, they have the power moves, and they don't list uh, TJ Watt in the power moves. In the power moves? Uh, like top they, they... 10 edge rusher power moves. Right, right. Madden is milking this thing. So uh, this is annoying. Like They used to just release them all at once, and that was fine. Now they're breaking this down into so many categories. It's just dumb. Yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, have they released the regular rankings yet? I'm not seeing anything, but I might be missing it somewhere. I don't know what's taking them so long. They announced Miles Garrett this morning. I thought they would announce the rest of them, so I uh, I don't know. And we're coming up on, I think yesterday was like at uh, noon, around noon Eastern time. Uh, anyway, uh, I saw that come across. I thought it was interesting there. All right. Uh, I think we've wrapped up enough for today. You and I will get back on it again on Friday. Uh, as always, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot, uh, follow Alex and, and, and get on him for his louder milk takes, uh, at Alex underscore. Cause, <laughs> cause oh boy, he came hard at you today. Yeah. didn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. at Alex underscore Kuzora, follow the show at terrible podcast, email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the college, go to Steeders Depot.com, hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you'd like an ad free, uh, version, uh, go to Steeders Depot.com, hit the ad free button up there up uh, right navigational bar as well and we will get busy after it again on friday so in the meantime uh, as always thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with dave and alex